Turn your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 6. We looked at some amazing encounters, some amazing narrative in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Last week, looking at the beheading of John the Baptist, the cruel, ugly, bloodthirsty experience. We looked at Jesus sending out the twelve two by two and all of the miracles that attended their goings as they preached the gospel of the kingdom. Today I want us to just continue through this passage, Mark 6 verses 30 to 44. I want to read that in a couple of minutes, but here I want you to what do I want you to know today? I want you to know that Jesus cares for us in totality. Our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our circumstances and necessities in life. He cares for you. Those four words should stagger us. Jesus cares for you. And if you know that, if you embrace that, how should you feel about that? Well, I, I hope that as we go through this day, there will be a, a sense of gratitude and awe for the many ways Jesus shows his compassion for us. And what should we do in the light of that? Because you see in the scriptures when we know something and when our hearts are gripped by it, there always, always should be action attending it. I want us to live as a thankful people in the name of Jesus and show compassion to fellow creatures made in the image of God to be like Jesus receive his compassion show his compassion so if you'll stand with me Mark 6 verses 30 to 44 follow along as I read the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught and he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. This is what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May we receive it like that today. As if, in the first catechism that Southern Baptists ever produced, as if God himself were speaking this to us today. Thank you, be seated. Well, I told you earlier, this story shows up in all four Gospels. In Matthew 14, 13 to 21, in Luke 9, 10 to 17, and in John 6, 1 to 13. The time and place of this are the Passover approaching. It is 
it is, as we put this together chronologically, it's the Passover that Jesus did not attend openly or publicly. It is approximately one year from when he will be put upon the cross. I want you to see in this, these verses today two things that struck me. First, there's often no rest for the weary. And second, Jesus' compassion is expressed in a miraculous meal. Verses 30 to 34 show us that there's often no rest for the weary. Think about what's happening. The disciples have been gone, and, and to their amazement, as they preach the gospel, preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The sick came to them and they healed them. Miraculous powers flowed forth from them. They come back, no, no doubt bug-eyed. They come back to tell Jesus, you won't believe what, what happened. You, you, the, the, the things that happened are amazing. In the same time, the death of John the Baptist occurs. And Jesus, his cousin, is grieving. You know he didn't take that news with a yawn or with an oh well or even with a glib, it's the will of God. The disciples are pumped up. Jesus has a heavy heart. And so our text tells us that when the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught, his response was, come away. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Now think about what's happening here. After that experience, no longer is it just Jesus who's performing miracles. Let me take care of something. Davis, go to your mother now. Thank you. Now his disciples, his disciples have been performing miracles. The word is spreading. And I want you to get something of the psychology and the mentality of the crowd. At the very least, they're thinking, if this man and his followers can do this for others, he can do this for me. But perhaps sliding up that bar, they're thinking, if this man can impart this power to his followers, perhaps he'll impart it to me. The crowds are gathering. He can't get away from them. We just told the text, many were coming and going. And they, speaking of Jesus and the disciples, had no leisure even to eat. They couldn't get away far enough even to eat. You remember this, those we've gone through, Mark, times when Jesus would, would go into the home of where he made his, his base camp, and the people would press to the door, the crowd all outside. And so Jesus puts the disciples in the boat, probably a, a similar boat or the same boat that he's used already. He, he taught from it earlier in Mark. And they're going to set across the lake. Now, you need to get what's happening here. So verse 32 says, they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going. They saw them get into the boat. They're going from this point to that point across the lake, Lake Tiberias. They recognized them and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. Now we will grant that perhaps the disciples were, were weary, <laughs> so their, their stroke uh, in the boat may not have been that crisp. But these people, this crowd, sees them get in the boat, runs along the shore. One commentator said it was probably about four and a half miles around run along the shore, probably telling other people about it as they're going. Plus, remember, it's the Passover season, so there are more people in the area than there typically are. And this crowd begins to form. They actually get there. I mean, think Jesus is coming in the boat to get away, and they, he gets there, and they're already there. And the crowd's grown. Whatever number he was getting away from when he got into the boat is a greater number when he's about to get out of the boat on the other side. This is the frenzy 
of people fascinated by who this man and his followers are and what they might do or impart, do for or impart to them. Notice Jesus' response. Or you got to just pause a moment and think, what would my response be? Are you kidding me? Really? It's not our Savior's response. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. Had compassion on them. His heart is moved by them, for them. What did he see? You see, many would have seen an irritating crowd that won't leave us alone. Don't you know about the American right to privacy? They wouldn't leave them alone. Jesus' observation though, is not attended by irritation, but compassion. Because what did he see? Because they were to him like sheep without a shepherd. And so he began to teach them many things. Brothers and sisters, when you get all in, as a Christ follower, committed to making disciple makers, you will find time, seasons, when seemingly there is no rest for the weary. But you know, weariness in the Lord's work is not a bad thing. The scripture does say, do not become weary in well-doing, for in due time you should. That's, that's talking about there, do not become so weary that you quit. But weariness in touching people for Jesus, weariness in mentoring people to be more like Jesus, weariness in meeting people's needs in Jesus' name, will put upon us the necessity of depending upon Him. If we can do it in our own strength, we don't need Him. But if we feel somewhat insecure or inadequate, the devil will say, you're inadequate. You're not up to this teaching opportunity they have with the little children or in the preschool area. You're not, you're not able to do that. And it's in those very moments when our inadequacy is confronted and challenged by a, a gospel opportunity that we will be forced to be reminded that we need Jesus and we will be forced upon Him to rest in Him, to draw strength from Him. Paul faced that in this thorn in the flesh, whatever that was. Lord, take this away so that I can be more effective in ministry for You. Because this, this weakens me. This cripples me. And Jesus' response was, in your weakness is when I'll show you my strength. It's a great lesson. Jesus teaches us here, if we'll let him, if we'll notice it. He had compassion on them. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And all oh, that, 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 those words, the shepherd of our souls, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. The Good Shepherd who calls His sheep and they recognize His voice. He says it in John 10, My sheep hear My voice. I know them and they follow Me. They won't follow a stranger. Jesus looks upon these people not, not necessarily as, as following the wrong way, but not having been shown the right way. The Shepherd following Jesus. And so he began to teach them many things. We don't know what time of day it was, but when you factor in crossing over in a boat, four and a half mile jaunt around the lake, we know that it will soon be evening. Let's look at the rest of this. Jesus' compassion is expressed in a miraculous meal. 
We're told in verse 35, when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. And the hour is now late. They're not, they're not talking about the horrible circumstances of the place. What they're talking about is this is not a populated place. This is not going to be a place where folks can, can take a lunch break or a, a dinner break and easily go find something to eat and us continue this, this wonderful teaching time. No, this place is it's not populated. It was not supposed to be. He, he was drawing aside to a place that would be desolated. He, he wanted to grieve with his disciples over the death of the Baptist. He, he wanted to, to debrief his disciples, lest they, lest they forget why and how they were able to do the miraculous things. He needed time alone with them to ground them again. Because, you know, healing people and casting out demons can go to your head if you let it. So it's a desolate place. Not a place with markets nearby where food can be had. So the disciples plead with him in verse 36, send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. The crowd's going to get hungry. When they get hungry, they may get unruly. But Jesus answered to them, grounds them. You give them something to eat. Master, miracle. We saw people heal. We, and we spoke in your name and people were able to rise up and walk. And we, we saw these mighty works performed in your name. You empowered us for this. And, and in case there was someone out there thinking, man, I can do anything. Paul would give the corrective to that years later in Philippians. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Jesus brings them back to earth. You give them something. It's, it's just if he would have said, you performed all these miracles when you were gone. You give them something to eat. Their response so typical. Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? It's, it's very similar to, the, to what Nicodemus said when Jesus said to him, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, shall I, shall I have to go back into my mother's womb to be born a second time? In other words, Lord, your, your affirmation, your assertion is not within my realm of logic. And that's right. That's where it's supposed to be. You give them something to eat. Where does that put them? That puts them where they ought to always be, where you and I ought to always be, totally depending on Jesus. And he said to them in verse 38, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Now, John's gospel tells us that there was a little boy there. Now, I don't know if they did a, just sort of wandering through the crowd, <laughs> looking to see if anybody had a lunch. If they began to inquire, does anyone, anyone here have a lunch? Did anyone think to bring a lunch? Now, I've got to say at this point, parenthetically, just to warn you, if you, if you, if you read Barclay's commentaries, which have some, some good... Uh, historical, geographical information in them. But it is not a safe guide when you talk about the power, the miracle power of Jesus. Because in Barclay's commentary on John's gospel about the little lad with the fish, here's what he said. He said the miracle that day was the little boy's generosity shaming all the people because when, when he offered his little lunch, then the people began to reach under their cloaks and take their lunches out. That is ridiculous. Because the text doesn't tell us that. So they find this lunch. When they found it, 
They said to him, five, that is five loaves of bread and two fish. All we could find, Master, was five loaves of bread and two fish. And they don't say this out loud, but they're probably thinking, and that won't even feed us. Jesus then says, command them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. These, these terms here of why they would have sat in hundreds and fifties, no one's really sure. In fact, someone has suggested that 50 times 100 is 5,000, that that may be what it was talking about was at least 5,000 men sat down. And by the way, I'm, I, there was a little lad there. I don't think it was only men. 5,000 men of households, 5,000 men of the community, perhaps they had their wives and children with them. And if they did, then this number grows. That's why, that's why I, I said uh, this great number, multiple thousands. So they brought it to him, five loaves, two fish. So he commands them to all sit down, and they do. And then Jesus takes, in verse 41, takes the five loaves and the two fish, and he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Typically the Jewish blessing would have been with a shawl over the head and head bowed. We thank you, God, creator of the universe. And they would then make their thanks known. They're asking known. Jesus lifts up his head with the meal in his hands, blessed it, and broke it, and began to give to the disciples to pass out among the people. The loaves and the fish he did this with. And then we're told this, and they all ate and were satisfied. You got to get the picture here, folks. First of all, the disciples, the 12 disciples could not accomplish this in one movement through the crowd. Use your sanctified imagination for a moment. Jesus blesses, and there are loaves of bread, more, more loaves than they had, and they begin to take, and, and the fish, if they had baskets or whatever, it's filling up, and they take that and they begin to distribute it among the people. People who are getting it are amazed. The folks who haven't gotten it yet are alarmed. And then they go back. He pours upon them more bread, more fish, and, he, and they go back again, and there's this, there's this movement back and forth, and you can almost hear the excitement of the people, oh, and the folks not getting it yet, oh, and ultimately, everyone has eaten, and brothers and sisters, I don't know if what was set before them, they ate, and there was more of it enough that, to satisfy them, or whether what was set before them, the Lord made adequate to satisfy them. We don't know what was going on there we, um, in those details, but we do know this. They all ate and were satisfied. Their, their stomachs were full. There was no hunger pain. Now, Jesus could have left it at that. But he sends the twelve back out among them. Says, go collect the leftovers. They go with twelve baskets. They come back with twelve baskets full of leftovers for them to eat. They haven't eaten yet. They're serving. At Jesus' word, they're serving the crowd. And I don't know how much 
was in each basket. I don't know if it was enough for a meal and then another meal. I don't know if when they left that place, if they, if they had eaten and they were satisfied and they took with them in a basket more food still so that that would burn into their conscience. That, that when they thought they faced a situation where, there was, where they were totally inadequate to meet the need, when they appealed to human means, Jesus put them in a position where if he didn't provide, it would not happen. And we're told those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. And as I said, if, if that's, quote, all there was, it's amazing. But if there were wives and children along, then it was many more than 5,000. Brothers and sisters, we, we meet times in our lives where we ourselves, maybe the circumstances have to do with us personally. Maybe, maybe it's physical. Maybe it's, it's mental. Maybe it's spiritual. Maybe it's circumstantial. Maybe it's, it's financial. It, we come to these times where we feel completely inadequate, perhaps overwhelmed, to know how to address that need. And if we learn anything from this passage, we should learn that Jesus cares for us. He looked upon a crowd of people that to our knowledge, none of them had confessed Him as Messiah. Thousands of people they're curious. You read the passage in John 6. They're going to follow him yet again. And ask him to do another miracle. Jesus says, you follow me because, because I fed you yesterday. He had compassion on people who had not confessed him nor committed their lives to following him. How much more, how much more will He have compassion on us in our trials? He would teach in another place, in this world you will have trouble. Some translations say tribulation. The word, I've told you about it before, the word is the word philipsis. And it means in this world you will be squeezed. You will be pressed by life. It's a truth that Jesus speaks. It's an inevitability that He addresses. But be of good cheer. For I have overcome the world. Perhaps it's not something that is, that is on you. Perhaps it's something that you are wanting to deal with and a friend, a loved one, a family member, a, a co-worker, a neighbor. And it seems like their situation is so overwhelmingly dark. It looks so fatal. That you're overwhelmed. I saw a quote from John Piper. He said, if you've never been in over your head in ministry and life, then you're swimming in the wrong waters. <laughs> you see... We want to live worry-free. We want to live trouble-free. We don't want to deal with physical pain and misery. We don't want to deal with a loved one in a desperate situation and we can't, we don't know what to do about it. And yet that's Exactly where Jesus shows up. Because we are all men and women with feet of clay, and 
If we think we have life by the tail, then we will, our, our sense of a need of Jesus will diminish and we will slowly, subtly, surely find ourselves resting in the things of this world. Damn, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see? There's light for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, when life presses in upon us, our responsibility is to fight the fight of faith by refocusing, recommitting, renewing the energies to find our ultimate satisfaction in Him. Because, as we've been taught, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. And we see in this passage Jesus' incredible compassion and concern for a crowd that was only curious. They weren't committed. The truth of that is, go read John chapter 6 today sometime. Because after that great feast, he teaches the bread of life discourse and speaks many things about, about his sovereign prerogative as Savior. And they turn, they all turn and walk away. So much so that Jesus says to the twelve, are you going to go with them? Are you going to follow them? And thank God. One of them said, if we turn our backs on you, where do we go? You alone have the words of life. Now, brothers and sisters, if you've not been there, you will be. And if you are there, you will come through it by God's grace. As we learn to rest in Him. You see, I heard a preacher say years ago about, the, about this narrative, what you, what you find is that if you will give all that you have to Jesus, that will always be more than enough. The true spirituality, life group. Studying Romans 12, passed out, I think, a blank check on a sheet last Sunday night, made payable to Jesus Christ. to be signed and delivered saying I'm all in all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give and we have to do that daily brothers and sisters that's not just a one time thing daily because our our temptation is that we're prone to wander we're prone to turn away from the only source of hope and help and happiness and healing but when we're convinced that Jesus cares for us in every aspect of our lives then we have a renewed sense of awe and wonder and anticipation to see him show himself. Or as some people, you hear them say, to see him show up. And by the way, it's when we are squeezed, when we are pressed upon, and people observe us, even folks perhaps trying to minister to us, and yet they meet, they meet in us a resolve that can only be explained by our confidence in the gospel then they are often gripped and struck. A 
I told you about Miss Agnes before. She was in a nursing home in Shreveport, Agnes King. And I would go see her. My, one of my responsibilities was to go visit those in nursing homes. They were scattered all across the city of Shreveport. And I had a little card on them the first time I went. I was reading Miss Agnes's situation. Paralyzed from the neck down for several years. I thought, oh Lord, help me. How am I going to go in and encourage this woman? So I prayed. I was 25 years old, fresh out of seminary. And I, and I walked in, told her who I was. She lit up like a lamp. She said, oh, I've, I, read, I read that the church had called you to be associate pastor. I've been longing to meet you. I want you to know I've been praying for you every day. How can I pray for you, Pastor Bill? Well, brothers and sisters, I walked out of that place just gripped. And every time I visited Agnes King through the years, it was just like that. Whatever you have, no matter how little you think it is, if you will give it all to Jesus, again and again, day by day, sometimes hour by hour, you will find in your life and you will find in your ministry to others that it is always more than enough. Whether that means that Jesus is tugging at your heartstring to, to teach our little preschoolers so that Joanna can have her baby, care for her baby. Whether that means he's tugging at your heartstrings to join up with Curtis Griffin and Realign this group of elementary children in a situation more conducive to their learning about Jesus. Whether it's serving in some capacity in this ministry, whether it's walking across the street to a neighbor, whether it's walking across the, the hall to a co-worker. Whatever it is, I promise you this, every one of you here, he has saved to serve. Thank you for those of you who do so beautifully. But never, never settle in. Always be wondering, Lord, what would you have me to do? Always be praying. Talk to others. What, what, do, you, what do you know about me? See about me that, 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 would, that you would tell me looks like the array of gifts God has given me to labor in this ministry. But do not let the devil rob you by telling you that you are inadequate, you are incompetent, you're not worthy of being used by Jesus. That's the devil's lie. The Holy Spirit will never tell you that. He will always say, trust Jesus. He's enough. Trust Jesus. I'll help you. I pray that your life will be one miracle after another that comes from your con commitment to and love for Jesus Christ and desire to give him all you have to see how he will bless. Because you see, he, he gave all he had. He laid down his life for you and for me. He took and bore in his body my sin and your sin on the tree. He he died that despicable death of the cross. He endured the wrath of God while hanging on the cross. He was buried in a borrowed tomb and rose three days later, just like he said he would, and is alive forevermore. Let's bow together. And as we bow, I want to ask you just where you are, just if you're a follower of Jesus to Recommit your life to Him. Everything you have to Him. If you've not yet, if you've not yet committed your life to Jesus, then I pray that today you would simply ask Him, Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, come into my life. Make me Yours. So that I may know You love you and serve you in this place 
and in places far beyond this place. Lord Jesus, as your spirit moves in our midst, do not pass us by. Meet your people at the point of the need as they cry out, whatever that is. But the greatest need here, Lord, for some is to come to Christ. And I pray that you will not pass them by today. That you will stop. Show them your love. Show them you care for them. Remind us that you care for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.